your attention. Our speaker is uh, only given a short amount of uh, leave to come here to Sydney. Uh, he's visiting from Melbourne, uh, Dr. Kevin Donnelly. Oh Dr. Donnelly has uh, spent most of his professional career in the area of education. And indeed, I think, you know, I don't want to uh, say anything correctly here, but I think one of the uh, greatest claims to fame he might have is to suggesting that there is uh, something called this uh, Judeo-Christian ethic and teachings and history that actually applies to syllabus or syllabi in our, our education system. Radical notion that that may be. Um, so on your behalf, I would like to thank Dr. Donnelly from, uh, for his trip, quick as it is. He's back to Melbourne at 10 o'clock. Um, and I would like to thank him for taking our invitation. Uh, no relation to the other Donnelly of last evening, but Greg was, uh, past his apologies, not being able to attend this evening. He had said it's been about five years since he last saw Kevin in person. Uh, but as you, or if you're from New South Wales, you will know that um, Greg will have some phone calls to be taking over the next few hours as leadership matters get discussed here in New South Wales as well as at the federal level. So on your behalf, I would like to welcome Dr. Kevin Donnelly and uh, I will let him outline his speech himself. Thank you very much. very much for the invitation. And if I just talk normally, can people hear me down the back? No. A bit loudly, so I have to talk. I was a teacher, so I should be able to do that. Uh, it's uh, an honour to be here, and thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, I met someone before. Where is he? Another Broadie boy. Yeah, yeah. He's down the back, good. You're not allowed to say anything tonight. <laughs> because I grew up in Broad Meadows as well. <laughs> And unlike Eddie, Eddie everywhere, I actually went to Broadie High and uh, I think Eddie went down the road to uh, Essendon. He obviously had more money than we did. But uh, yeah, no, I grew up in Broadmeadows all those years ago. And the funny story is, and some of you might know it, is that my father was in the railways and uh, the railways then at the Newport workshops in Melbourne was a communist cell and this was during the 50s and 60s. And so Dad was a good communist, if there is such a thing. Uh, and Mum was a good Catholic, thankfully. So it was Dominic's on, on Sunday for communion and confirmation and, and, and mass and the Stations of the Cross and the Paramours. And it was uh, on Tuesday it was Dad with Stalin and Lenin and the Glorious People's Revolution. <laughs> Not that that worked out too well. If you know anything about it, young people seem to have forgotten that if you know about Stalin and Lenin and what actually Mao did in China as well, you'd know that untold millions were, were tortured, killed, impoverished. But no, I grew up in Broad Meadows and uh, I might wing it a bit. I've got some notes here, but I think it's probably more important that I just talk directly to you that growing up in Broadmeadows back then it was a housing commission estate but it was a great time to be a young kid, enjoy being a young kid. <laughs> we were free range children back then, we were free range so we used to ride our bikes with our helmets and stand on the seat. <laughs> we were allowed to. Uh, and where I lived in Gibson Street was St Joseph's Baby's Home behind us, which is now a, a Catholic college. But we used to climb the trees and, and fall out and hurt ourselves and scrape our knees and sprain our wrists, but nobody cared because we only wanted to be home when we got fed or when we slept. And uh, it was a different life, but it was a great life. So growing up in Broad Meadows with a communist father who put me in the Eureka Youth Movement when I was about 12, which is the Young Communist Party of Australia. But as I said, Mum was a good Catholic and I was fortunate enough to meet Bob Santa Maria a number of times, God bless him. And he always said to me, Kevin, you've had a very interesting childhood <laughs> because you've learned so much about what are the most, probably two most powerful 
Well, one's an ideology, the other is a faith. But two most powerful forces that we've had in, in the 19th and 20th century. So anyway, uh, growing up in Broadmeadows taught me a lot. And uh, one of the things that taught me was that faith was important and education was important. And so, as we did back then, we worked hard our studies. I was fortunate to go to university, get a degree in teaching, taught. And when I was teaching out at Maryland's near Reservoir in Melbourne, which was uh, a migrant area, thoroughly enjoyed it, Joan Kerner became the Education Minister in Victoria. Who's from Victoria here? If I can. So some of you will understand. And Joan Kerner was Education Minister, then Premier, and Mother Russia, as I call her, gave a talk at a Fabian Society back in the day. I think it was about 1982, 85. And what Joan Kerner said was that education had to be about the socialist transformation of society. And in her speech, from I often quote it uh, in the books I've written, she said that, that education as it currently was, was about reinforcing capitalist hierarchies. It was all about uh, elites. She hated Year 12, even though she went to a private girls' school, did Year 12, and this is an interesting thing about the left, the cultural left. They often get the most out of our society, but they then want to overthrow it, and they want to change it for whatever reason. But Kerner argued that education had to be about the socialist transformation of society, and not an instrument to reinforce capitalism. That's why she disliked the high school certificate. Back then, uh, she wanted to get rid of the high school certificate because somehow, some people failed. Some people did well, some people didn't. Back in the day, at uh, Broadie High, I failed French in year nine, maths in year 10, and echo in year 12. But that was a long time ago when we actually failed children and said that <laughs> what you've done is not good enough. I now understand underage football, they don't even pick the scores uh, because they don't want to damage their little psyches because they've got to nurture them and care for them, care, share, grow, but anyway. So Joan Kerner, when I was uh, teaching, was the education minister, and I became so upset about what she was doing that I went back to university and did postgrad, postgraduate. So I did a master's and a, and a PhD in education. And I was very lucky in a sense that uh, Bob San Maria had told me, know your enemy. Know your enemy. And those of you who know what Bob did, BA, he was a consummate politician in terms of knowing what the Labor Party was up to, knowing what the communist cells were up to, both here and internationally. So I went back and I studied at university and I realised at the time that education, school education in particular, was being radically changed. And I'll just get my notes here, which I will refer to, if I can find it. And when I reviewed the national curriculum in, in just four years ago, I, I saw this again, and I'll get to that in a minute, but what happened was that in education during the 70s and 80s, the cultural left, as I call it, and this had happened in the 20s and 30s at the Frankfurt School in Germany, where the idea was that the then Marxist academics understood they would never win the revolution on the streets they would never be able to storm the barricades uh, because in the West, whether it was America, New Zealand, Australia, England, Europe, wherever it was, the workers were pretty happy because capitalism, and I'm not saying I'm a capitalist, but it was a mixed society, governments do have a role, but, but what was working was that people could, if they worked, they could have a profitable life, they could have a good life, they could get the basic necessities, and they were happy with what society was able to produce and provide. But the Marxists <coughs> understood, and especially after Stalin, that communism in the West was never going to succeed in terms of a revolution. So what they did was to argue that you take, and some of you would know the expression, take the long march 
through the institutions. So this was during the 30s, 40s. The idea was that if you could take control of the institutions of society, family, church, schools, <coughs> universities, the ABC, the Sydney Morning Herald, <laughs> if you could take control, then you would win what John Howard called the battle of ideas. And as a segue, I was chief of staff to Kevin Andrews during the Howard government and saw a lot of what Prime Minister Howard had to say and talk about. And he was very strong on the culture wars, as we call them. But anyway, the left back then decided that the way they would try and win the revolution, overthrow <coughs> capitalism, uh, Western society, Western civilization, and enemy number one in many ways was Judeo-Christianity, as we well know historically, that one of the first things a totalitarian government does, a dictatorial government does, is to not only destroy the family, but to destroy the church and, and, the, and the teachings of the church. So when I was studying this, it became obvious to me that there needed to be uh, more awareness of what was happening in schools in Australia, also Europe, England, America. Because during the 60s and 70s, some of you are old enough to remember, I hope, uh, Jermaine Greer, the female yeah. union. <laughs> <laughs> Vietnam, did anybody go on a Vietnam moratorium? Yeah, a few of us here, old radicals. Uh, Jim Cairns, he was the bloke then. But the 60s and 70s was a time of Vietnam moratorium, Jermaine Greer, and uh, Cardinal Ratzinger, be before he became Pope Benedict, talks about this as an epochal time in Western civilization. Because what happened during the 60s and 70s was that the cultural left rediscovered the work of the Frankfurt School, 20s and 30s, and this whole idea of what they call critical theory. So, and I'll talk about this briefly with safe schools, that critical theory became very powerful in our universities and schools in what was taught. So this was a time during the 70s when established authorities, as I said, church, family, universities, were attacked and condemned. And we see this now with the attacks on the Ramsey Centre for Western civilization. The, the cultural left see these uh, institutions, and it's a bit of jargon, but they're Eurocentric, patriarchal, homophobic, trans, uh, whatever, Islamophobic, it goes on and on. And I was attacked when I reviewed the national curriculum, because I argued there should be a greater focus on Judeo-Christianity. Oh, Forgive me, terrible. and I actually said that on the ABC, which was apparently even worse. <laughs> but I was attacked in the Twitter sphere and on, on Instagram, Facebook and all the rest, all the social networks. And the worst thing of all I was called was Christian, but anyway. <laughs> and at this time as well, as I mentioned with Joan Kerner, there was an attack on academic <coughs> curriculum or curricula, but the idea was you didn't study physics, chemistry, math, science, literature, art, music, because they were all elitist, unjust, and Eurocentric. And what they meant was that instead of learning knowledge being inherently worthwhile, instead of knowledge being about wisdom and truth, as uh, Cardinal Newman would say, knowledge was a social construct. Knowledge was about how the elites how the hierarchies, how those in charge of society oppressed and uh, disadvantaged the victim groups. So it kind of, if you know about the whole idea now of identity politics, of victimhood, what happened during the 70s was that in education, the argument was from the left that you had to get rid of academic studies because it reinforced all of these terrible things that in fact all of them had benefited from but didn't want to admit it, there you go. The worst thing that happened though was received knowledge and wisdom became undervalued and critiqued and attacked. So there is no such thing as truth or wisdom. And I, I mentioned before Cardinal Ratzinger, he wrote a book along with Marcello Piera some years ago about this in Without Roots, 
which was about relativism, Islam, and, uh, and, and Christianity. But Pira argued, and I'll quote him, there are no grounds for our values, no solid proof or argument establishing that any one thing is better or more valid than another. And what, uh, when he became the Pope, what, what Ratzinger talked about is that if everything is relative, if everything is subjective, if everything is about power relationships, <coughs> then the Bible simply becomes one text among many that can be deconstructed if you know about postmodernism and deconstruction. It can be critiqued and deconstructed along with anything else. So the word of God simply becomes words on a page that have no inherent meaning or no value. Now Pope John Paul uh, the second made a similar point and I'll quote him a legitimate plurality of positions has yielded to an undifferentiated pluralism based on the assumption that all positions are equally valid. All positions are equally valid which is one of today's most widespread symptoms of a lack of confidence in truth. If all things are equally valid, there is no good or evil. And you can see what happened to Israel Folau for simply quoting the Bible and saying that there is hell and that if you commit sins, what I was taught as a mortal sin, then hell was waiting unless you turn to God and ask for forgiveness. But if everything's about being relative and subjective, there is no truth, there are no absolutes. So the Bible is simply one text among many. And the most extreme example of that, some of you would know, is Safe Schools program, which, uh, to I think their great discredit, was financed by Liberal and Labor governments, federal. Now it began in Victoria, under the left Labor government, but it then spread around Australia and in the end was funded by the Commonwealth Government and uh, even under Tony Abbott when he was Prime Minister. And I remember Scott Ryan, Senator Ryan, who I know very well, he launched the program a couple of years ago when Chris Pine was the Minister for Education. I think Pine realised he didn't want to touch it so he gave it to Senator Scott Ryan to do. But I said to Scott, well, look mate, this program's no good. And Scott was a bit uneasy about it. But when I was Chief of Staff to Kevin Andrews, and I'll segue a bit, <coughs> what happens in a minister's office rarely bears any relationship to what happens on the ground. So you can be in Canberra or Sydney or wherever it might be, Melbourne or Perth or Hobart. As a minister, you might make a decision and then give it to the bureaucrats. But then four or five months later, a year later, what you see on the ground is often totally different. And the way of politics at the moment is it's so much more about the 30 second sound grab, about the media cycle, that often politicians themselves don't have enough time to delve into what the actual issues are and what the implications are. Whereas I've not met him, but Greg Donnelly <coughs> I respect a lot from the emails and the conversations I've had over the phone because that's something he does do. But anyway, to get back to Safe Schools, it was a national program, some of you would know of it. Primary and secondary school students were taught that gender is fluid and limitless, and that you could be, you could self-identify as whatever gender you prefer. So I'm talking about primary school kids. There was a, a, a book that went into even kindergarten about the gender fairy, where she would have a wand and say that if you want to be a particular gender, out of the 40 or 50 that are now the LGBTQI plus categories, the plus is because they're never quite sure might, what might happen next week. There could be a whole new gender suddenly in, in, on the field. But anyway, the gender fairy said do whatever you want. The irony is that 98% of Australians, and the research I looked at this very carefully, 98% of Australians identify as male or female. But in schools, I were teaching children that 10, 15% of, of children, of the young adults and Australians, can be whatever gender they want. It really was uh, what Camille Parlier, the American feminist, 
cause child abuse, even though they didn't realise that. Traditional gender concepts were heteronormative, homophobic, transphobic, sexist. So there was a whole wealth of material here going into schools uh, around Australia, primary and secondary, pushing this line. And even when I look at this more carefully, Ros Ward, who helped design the program from La Trobe University, she's a lesbian Marxist, which is fine. I have no problem with whatever people decide they want to be. But she actually admitted at a socialist forum that safe schools had nothing to do with anti-bullying. It was nothing to do with actually making schools a safer place. It was all about, and you can look at her speech if you can, I think it's still on YouTube, it was all about transforming capitalist society to a marvellous rainbow, rainbow alliance of utopian where under this sort of neo-Marxist view of theory, you could be whatever gender you want. And this is where what was called critical theory in the 20s and 30s, that started in the Frankfurt School, gender theory is the most recent sort of offshoot. So if you study a lot of this, if you're having a sleepless night and you want to be bored, there's a whole wealth of theories, this rainbow lines, whether it's postmodernism, deconstructionism, whether it's gender theory, whether it's, uh, there's even a theory about whiteness, I don't know if you know that one. I think looking around, you're, all of you are very guilty of whiteness, except there are a couple <laughs> who aren't. But Sydney University, uh, who knocked back the Ramsey Foundation bequest, uh, there are lecturers there who argue in whiteness, and that is about Eurocentric, patriarchal, misogynist, binary people, <laughs> who are very dangerous, apparently, because they're destroying the planet and uh, causing everyone else to feel disadvantaged and oppressed. But when I, and this goes back to when I did, you know, post-grad. In education, the long march has been successful. I don't want to leave you too depressed, but the barbarians are no longer at the gates. It's like if you saw the last episode of the day, game of, what's that show, Game of Thrones? The barbarians took the citadels. In education, They've basically won the game. That's why the Ramsey Centre is finding it so difficult to get into a university. That's why when I reviewed the national curriculum, and we took seven or eight months to do that, I'll ask you this. In the national curriculum, Indigenous, Torres Strait Islander, culture, history, spirituality, is a cross-curricular priority, perspective, that has to be taught in every subject from kindergarten to year 10. So Aboriginal Indigenous, culture, history, spirituality, <coughs> every subject, kindergarten to year 10. If you look through the national curriculum, as we had to do, there are literally thousands of pages, English, math, science, music, history, physics, whatever. There are probably four references to Judeo-Christianity or Christianity. Four references. Whereas with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander, there are literally hundreds. So what the danger is, from my point of view, is that so many young people now, and it's been going on for 10, 20 years, are leaving school without any strong sense or understanding of what underpins Australian society in terms of our Judeo-Christian heritage. And I wrote an article in The Australian this week about uh, the election. And I wrote one the week before about uh, what's happened to society. But Judeo-Christianity, certainly the New Testament, is now a closed book to most young people. There was a survey in Australia last year, one in America. Over 50% of Generation Z, Z, 50% do not understand why a Western liberal democracy, Westminster Parliament, is preferable to socialism. They don't understand. That was the question, because it's no longer taught in schools. They don't have that historical memory. So there is a real issue here that needs to be addressed in terms of how do you turn this around. And uh, 
I'll talk quickly about that. In England, uh, under Cameron, there was uh, a very ongoing argument. There was a great book, uh, Douglas Murray, The Strange, well, The Death of Europe. Anybody read it? I can make it up then, that's all right. <laughs> <laughs> but Douglas Murray, it's a world bestseller. I mean, he talked about what was happening in England, UK, and Europe over the last 10, 20 years with uh, not just a million young Islamic men going into Germany, for example, and not only with London now being Londistan, and I don't want to be Islamophobic, but the reality is, in London now, there are parts of the city that are no-go zones, in Paris the same, certainly uh, in Germany, and there are those in England who want Sharia law. Now, I don't want to get too sort of controversial, but uh, what Douglas Murray argues in his book is that on one hand, you have a lot of migration of, of people who, whose religion or views, if not hostile, are not in tune with the Christian tradition. And so what happens when you get different cultures meeting? But he also argued that Christianity was being airbrushed from history and what was being taught in Europe and England. And it's also happened in Australia. So the argument here is that if on one hand the world is becoming more complex, more difficult, more uh, stressful, more people are more anxious for a variety of reasons, if at the same time Christianity is no longer a viable force in terms of faith, religion, belief, what is it that grounds people? What is it that gives them a sense of not just a moral compass, but a sense of community? a sense of loving their neighbours, of being part of a story, the Bible story, which brings us together as you are here, obviously, tonight. We have to understand what the problem is, and that's what Bob Sandere taught, taught me. Know your enemy. And the first place to start is that to understand Christianity is a fundamental part of Western culture, Western civilization. As I mentioned, Christianity underpins our political and our legal system. That's why our parliaments begin with the Lord's Prayer, except for the ACT, which is more a local council, where they don't do the Lord's Prayer. But our parliaments begin with the Lord's Prayer, the preamble to the Constitution, talks about Almighty God. Uh, there's a very good academic in Perth, Augusto Zimmerman, who's written a lot about this. Concepts like conscience, Good and evil, forgiveness, redemption, love thy neighbour as thyself. If you look at concepts like that in the Ten Commandments, they've obviously come from Christi Jedi Christianity. A very good, good book was On Liberty by Stephen Trop a couple of years ago, where he traced the whole change of, from, from Rome to, to Europe during the 15th, 16th, 17th century to modern Europe, Western civilization. And Stephen Trop very persuasively points out that the reason we have liberty, freedom, is because of the New Testament. And the Americans would agree with that. I mean, when they talk about life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, they actually say that these rights are God-given. So I think the first step is to be <coughs> acknowledge and defend and articulate what it is about Christianity that is so worthwhile and so beneficial. And if we don't do that, we vacate the field, we give the field to the enemy. And I will call some of these people the enemy. Uh, <coughs> Archbishop Fisher gave a very good talk last year that I was at, where he made the point that secularism in itself is a reasonable concept philosophy. But if you get extreme secularism, this kind of radical secularism, which we saw with Margaret Court being attacked last year when she argued against same-sex marriage, when we saw Israel Folau attacked last year, losing his contract this year. If you see the way, Tony Abbott I know quite well, if you see the way Abbott years ago was vilified as the mad monk because of his Christian beliefs, if you saw the way Kevin Andrews, who I worked with, 
was abused and vilified after he argued against euthanasia and helped overturn the Northern Territory Bill. We have to understand that uh, secularism in itself might be beneficial. We're not a theocracy, so we're not like Saudi Arabia or Iran, but extreme secularism that tries to banish Christianity from the public square and public debate and from politics is quite a danger, especially when it comes to Catholic schools, and I will mention Catholic schools, because, and I'll be frank here, a lot of the debate about non-government schools has been about funding. And we've spent so much time arguing about funding from state and federal governments that we've forgotten the reason why religious schools are there. They're there to teach the faith. And as Bob Santa Maria said to me, if you suck with the devil, eat with a long spoon. Just be very careful that if you enter into these agreements, what it is that you're losing as well as gaining. Now, I'll just finish with uh, a couple of points. One of the things that struck me when I reviewed the national curriculum is that there's a lot of talk about values. And even now, you know, with uh, politics, with government, with banks, for some reason, they still talk about values. And I, I wrote an article for The Australian a couple of, last year <coughs> where I said, well, we really should be talking about virtues. Forget the values. I mean, values are OK, but let's get serious. If we're teaching young kids, let's give them a sense of what the virtues are. And uh, if you're looking at justice, wisdom, courage, moderation, faith, hope, love, a lot of this comes from Christian teaching. And it's vitally important that we reaffirm that and give young people a sense. On one hand, you've got this whole postmodern deconstructed theory, which is all about power and what Tony Abbott called the new trinity of gender, ethnicity, class. We need to make sure that in the school curriculum and what happens in schools, it's not this negative, very bleak curriculum about victimhood, about identity politics, politically correct, we need to actually reassert the value of a good Christian education in terms of the virtues, I'd suggest. Because virtues, by their very nature, give a consistent, strong moral code, and it's not based on what's relative or subjective or because you wake up one morning and this is what you feel is true. You actually have to be taught about the virtues. And Cardinal Newman talked about this, his ideal of a university. Freedom, calmness, moderation, wisdom. And I'll just finish with the election. I was quite amazed, and I am a liberal, I worked for Kevin Andrews. I'm quite amazed that, uh, with the result. One of the sleepers was religion and freedom of expression. And uh, in the Australian Today, the editorial, I'll just quote that. The Weekend Australian, the Grattan Institute, showed a strong correlation between seats with high proportions of religious voters and swings to the coalition. Labor front bencher Chris Bowen suffered a 5.4% swing in Western Sydney, which has the second highest percentage of religious people in, in Australia. He said that was an issue. And so, to my mind, there's a bit of light there at the end of the tunnel, because if people are more aware of their rights and, as Christians, not just from a religious point of view, but because of freedom of expression, freedom of conscience, then if we can win that argument, the world, Australia, will be a lot better. Thank you. Such was the public outcry and, and the media outcry, and I was writing a lot then and doing a lot of radio and TV. There was a federal inquiry into state schools, in my, sorry, safe schools, you might know. And it, after that inquiry, most, because the federal government stopped funding it, most of the states and territories pulled away from it, except from what I understand, Victoria and Western Australia, where it's still being rolled out and implemented. But if you look at uh, other states, territories, it was knocked on the head. But I think Victoria and WA are still doing it. Well, I'd look into that. Yeah.
behind you. Kevin, consistency is not a not a big thing with the, the new left. Um, they're prepared to argue the science on climate change, but they don't allow the science on gender. True. <laughs> I mean that's that's the contradiction is there. I mean the contradiction and, and uh, Israel Falau is a good example, but the left, cultural left as I call it, always argues about diversity and difference and and, and respecting points of view and there is no truth, you know, it's impossible to make judgments, everything is subjective, except on climate change, when it's a proven fact. We all know it's there. And uh, with gender, so it's obvious. I mean, forget that 98% of people identify as men or women. Forget that about 99% of babies, genetically, uh, are boys or girls. The left, the cultural left, and there's a word for it, cognitive dissonance, which you're nodding your head. <laughs> you understand it? Yeah. So the idea of cognitive dissonance is that you're able to hold contradictory ideas at the same time and not appreciate or realise that in fact you're wrong, that it is contradictory. Uh, and I have, I should give the book a plug, I have written a book uh, last year, How Political Correctness is Destroying Australia, where uh, a lot of the articles I've written, where it talks a lot about this and safe schools and also uh, what we should be doing. But cognitive dissonance, and that's a real issue because if they're not prepared to accept reason and, and rationality and empirical evidence, as uh, when I was doing the post-grad work, as uh, somebody argued back then, the only solution is either violence or insanity. Because it's epistemological suicide to kind of think that there is no truth. If there is no truth, then the statement is is not true. <laughs> so you get in this sort of cycle of like looking into mirrors. But I take it. Yeah. Kevin, I, I'm just wondering why governments around our democratic nations seem very susceptible to reporting plagiarism. So it's very interesting reading Mark Latham's um, speech when he got into the upper house in New South Wales about uh, gender ideology and how in the 2016 Australian census, uh, it was 0.0002%, 1,300 Australians identified as transgender, but it's spending millions of dollars of education oh, no. programs and toilets and everything. Why do we fall for this? When I, when I was a teacher, I, literature, I taught Aldous Huxley and George Orwell. And if you've read things like 1984 or uh, Brave New World, <coughs> part of it is groupthink. That, that, that Unfortunately, an education has contributed to this. We got rid of clear thinking, I think, around about 1970. So a lot of it is groupthink. So it's a matter of people not having, not just the willingness or ability to contradict others, because if there is this groupthink and you're at work or at a barbecue or even at a dinner with neighbours and you say what you say is right, if it contradicts what is now the orthodoxy, you can be attacked and vilified. So part of it is groupthink, but also, as I said, the left started the long march during the 40s and 50s, and it's been there for a long time. So part of the problem there is that in our schools and universities, it's been years. I think, frankly, I was one of the last going through that was taught to be independently minded and to weigh evidence and to balance objectively uh, and to be impartial. Because now they're taught that it's all about social constructs, power relationships, and uh, in that sense, a lot of young people, and I think it is child abuse, don't have the ability to discriminate or to weigh evidence. And that's why over 50% don't know why a Western liberal democracy is any better than socialists, like Venezuela. <laughs> God help us. But anyway. Now, Dr. Kevin, you made a clear statement that the role of Catholic schools is to teach the faith. Absolutely. 
Where I am in Queensland, they say the role of Catholic schools is to give them the history of the faith as a, as a subject, but the family is the place where the faith is taught and taught and not the schools. What do you say to that? I mean, there's an element of truth in it. I've always argued the family is, you know, parents are their primary carers of the children. Parents are their primary educators. <coughs> but I mean, for what it's worth, my mum and dad was a communist, mum was a good Catholic. I relied on school, even though it was a state school, to give me the education that allowed me to be able to understand and to think and to achieve what I had. I think schools have an obligation, Catholic schools in particular, have an obligation to teach the faith. Last year I went to some evangelical, non-denominational schools in Queensland, one with 1,400 kids. And since it's opened another campus, I'm going to Sunshine Coast next week to talk to another group of non-denominational, low-fee-paying Christian schools. And they're not afraid to identify as Christian schools. And when you read, read their prospectus and when you look at their webpage, they talk about virtue and about faith and about Jesus, the word of... So I think you have to... Yeah. In England, they called it muscular Christianity when Cameron was talking about it as Prime Minister. And it was a marvellous time back then. Uh, all the different religious groups got together and did ten Christian values for England. And they circulated it to everyone. And they argued that England was a Christian country, that its parliamentary legal system was underpinned by Christianity. So I think we, we need a bit more muscular Christianity. Thanks. Thanks again, Doctor. And Kevin. we, Kevin, <coughs> he gets upset when I call him Doctor. Um, thank you very much on My behalf pleasure. of not only myself, but all the delegates and all the state chairmen and the Supreme Knight, we'd like to thank you for coming and being with us tonight. And one appetite again, because we're uh, going to have dinner, and then I've got to get the doctor to the airport, even though he doesn't want to call him. And then we've got some other official duties after our main course. Thank you.